Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Steel of Sanctuary podcast. I'm your host, Dave Rivero from steelofsanctuary.com. And today we've got Ron Lipbach with me. Ron, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Long time. Uh, glad to be back. Yeah, too long, actually. We, we got to get you on more often. Um, let's jump right into some Steelers news. Uh, apparently, Jeremy Chin turned the Steelers down, which I thought was very interesting. That doesn't happen too often. Yeah, I was surprised, too. Um, I mean, I kind of like Deshaun Elliott, so I kind of like if he was the uh, the pseudo fallback position, I'm kind of more of a fan of that anyway. Chin is a good, really good player, good coverage guy, but I'm not sure he's as physical as the Steelers like in their safety. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think they did it just fine with with Elliott. So, you know, water under the bridge as far as as far as I'm concerned anyway. Yeah, same here. I mean, I think Jeremy, Jeremy Chin might be slightly better, but you're right. He, I think Deshaun Elliott's a better fit and – I think it worked out better for the Steelers in the long run. Uh, just kind of surprised. Mike Tomlin doesn't lose many, right? When he decides to try to go for somebody. No, he doesn't. And especially when it's when it's it's beyond money, right? So I think yeah. you know, once you get to the point of just is it is it a fit? You know, and, and Chin said, like the you know, the the defensive scheme was a different, you know, was more of a fit for where he went, but you know, it's it's the commanders, you know. So that, yeah, exactly. that's exactly the thing that makes it like, uh, you know, a little bit like, oh, that that's kind of like like a low blow. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, everyone lives with their decisions and yeah. <laughs> you have to live with that one. Is. Yeah. Um, I think he did get a couple million more guaranteed than the Steelers were. Well, if we compare it to the Deshaun Elliott contract, it's right. a couple million more. So who knows if that's. Yeah. I mean, it's exactly funny because we like, like, we like Basha at like two million. It's like a couple million, like whatever. But, you know, a couple yeah. million, like if someone came to me and said, hey, I'll give you two million more. Yeah, yeah, we both go to Washington in a heartbeat. I don't care if it's in Alaska, you know, like I'm, I'm there. So. 100%. 100%. Uh, I got a kick out of this one. Russell Wilson, it was reported that Russell Wilson has a no trade clause in his contract. I mean, talk about insignificant. Yeah. This goes one yeah. of two ways, right? He's either great and they don't want to trade him, or he's terrible and nobody wants him. So it's like no trade clauses. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I understand that at all. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that was really funny to me too. It just, I, you know, I don't even know what to do with that. Like a no trade clause for a guy on a one year contract is sort of like saying, you know, Denzel Mims might not get traded. You know, it's like, you know, <laughs> I, I love Denzel Mims as in his potential, but I mean, you know, if if we're at the point where we're talking about trading, you know, then then we, yeah, I don't know, we're go, we got different issues. Yeah, for sure. Um, <clears throat> speaking of funny, Chase Claypool is apparently doing very well in Buffalo's training camp. Um, are you buying this? Do you think he can actually make an impact on that team? I kind of think he, if they can straighten him out, he definitely could. I think, you know, Claypool's the kind of guy who's going to, you know, I think, you know, what do, what do I know for certain? But I think he's the kind of guy who could straighten himself out for a while and then sort of fall back into those old ways. But, I mean, he's look, his rookie year, he was phenomenal. I mean, he he did a numerous, you know, numerous things. He wasn't just like a great receiver. He was great in in the number of ways that they utilized him. And he's got great talent. He's got great speed. He's a big dude. I mean, he there's a lot of things this guy can do when he sets his mind to it. Sometimes, you know, when you're in your last, you know, your last, you know, I guess the last effort, you know, your last chance, you know, you you step up. Sometimes you don't. But He's got all the ability, and he's certainly got a a, a quarterback who can get on the ball. So, yeah. I think it's, you know, I hope he does well. I I think that you know he's just got his got to get his head on straight a little bit. But that's, you know, he he's shown he's got the talent. So, but there also there also is a big difference between OTAs and camp and yeah, getting out there on Sunday. So we'll see how he does for for real. I mean, you made the point. He's got all the talent in the world. It was, I think that rookie season went to his head. Um, yeah, having Juju be the Smith. first receiver that uh, yeah. that's happened to a Pittsburgh. I mean, you know, Troy Edwards had that happen to him. Yep, and he was open about that. You know, you, you know, it's hard. You know, you, you these guys are pumped up from from you know day one in college. They have success mm -hmm. there. They go to the NFL. They have a great rookie year. You know, they're untouchable in their heads. And so, you know, sometimes you got to be a little humbled. We'll see if that works for them. I mean, being cut a couple times and traded, that that, that doesn't humble you. Nothing will. So hopefully yeah, no he's question. gotten no, the message. No question. Um, Longtime Steeler scout Phil Kreidler retired. That's uh, He's been around since the Cower days, right? He's been there a long yeah. time. He's been a fixture yeah. with the Steeler scouting department. 
Yeah, I'm gonna try to set something up with him next week. He's he's another one of those those guys that um, you know, like you said, has been there for a while. I essentially because I spoke to it was a like Kentley Platt, who's he's the guy who's, who launched the RAS the RAS stuff, uh, and I'll, I'll throw the interview out next week. But his point was with the Steelers specifically that before you know two years ago, coincidentally enough. The uh, the Steelers' RAS scores for their draft picks and the guys they signed were really low. They were like seven. They were like one of the lower ones in the league. Hmm. Since you know, since that two year mark when Colbert left and and they brought you know the whole new sort of scouting and front office approach, that RAS score is one of the highest in the NFL. Hmm. So you know they're clearly taking a different approach. And you know you don't want to just strip out all that legacy and all that uh, you know sort of institutional knowledge all at once but you could tell Gorshak there, there's a complete turnover of that scouting yep. and uh, yep. you know it looks like they are trying to, to modernize things whether you know I, I assume that's a good thing they're trying to really sort of beef up their statistics and, and their analytics which I think is you know that that's something that we have seen that they're doing as well so they're really trying to get in the modern age and moving away from it's just about film film's still going to be the, the big thing but you got guys like Kreidler and Gorshak and those guys who are awesome guys and and they know more in one minute than I'll know in, in a lifetime of, yeah. of football. But you know, they yeah, you know, they're a little old school. And I think that they are probably looking for people who are really more willing to lean into the analytics, more willing to lean into the, you know, the athletic ability as opposed to just what you see on film. Yeah, you do get the the, the the feeling that Omar Khan's kind of overhauling the scouting department into something more his of his liking. Um, and that's going to happen. I mean, maybe it was time. A lot of these guys have been around a long time. I mean, you can't you can't argue with the results. These last two drafts have been pretty good as far as we can tell. It's early, but it seems like they've re- been really killing it, really. I mean, when you look at the players they've drafted and, and how well they've done. So we'll see what happens. I mean, there's something to be said for experience. And and being around and some of the old school stuff, which I kind of tend because I'm I'm old, so I kind of tend to lean in that direction. But yeah, you can't argue with with that analytics and some of the stuff is taken over the league. And if you're not at least part of it, then you're going to get left behind. I don't think yeah. there's a question. And just the the cautionary tale of all this is that yeah, you, know, you still have to see how it plays out on the field, right? So mm-hmm. everyone loves these two drafts. We've loved drafts in the past that three or four years later, we look back on and say, wait, that didn't turn out like we thought. So, you know, it, it's, you know, they're cautionary, you know, it's, you know, we, we still have to see, right? So that's the one thing I would sort of guard against is, you know, are Broderick Jones and all these guys going to be the everything that everyone thought they would be, you know, you could look at a guy like Porter and say, like, that guy's already probably there, right? But, yeah, you know, Darnell it's Washington... Yeah, I mean, you know, everyone thought like, "Wow, what an amazing steal! This guy is going to be amazing." You know, look, we need to see. You know, we haven't seen anything yet, right? So, uh, you know, we—that's the only thing I'll say with all these things is, you know, this is a whole new approach. We love the you know the value that we got at those picks. Yeah, but you know, there's something to be said for the fact that no one else took those guys up until those Steelers picks. So. I'm not saying that these picks aren't great and that these guys won't pan out, but I'm just saying we need to see before we start sort of elevating this, these drafts and, and, and this new administration as 10 times better than, than what we've seen in the past. One thing about Omar Khan, and I talk about this with Dave a lot, is he's much more willing to take risk in terms of injury than, than it seemed like the previous yeah. regime was for sure. I mean, this Corey Trices and Peyton Wilson's, I don't know if the Steelers would have touched Peyton Wilson with a, 10 foot pole with and Washington too. Darnell Washington was, yep. was ludicrous. Yep. Now the one thing I'll say is like they did look at he, you know, Heath Miller was an injury risk. Yes. Uh, so you know I forgot about that. One, bit of that. But I but you're right. I, I think that they are willing to take more risk. The the thing that I will say personally drives me nuts is this the idea that this new scouting department, this new management team is doing so much more in, in some ways they are in some ways, you know, they're kind of not, I mean, they didn't wheel and deal the draft, right. They, they stayed put every mm-hmm. pick and they got really good guys. Uh, we think, right. And, yeah. but it's not like they wheeled and dealed and did the bill of check stuff of the years ago where he got like 
50 new draft picks because of all these trades. Yeah, trade trade. downs and stuff, yeah. Right, so, you know, I I just try to, like, sort of level set that a little bit in my own head that, look, you know, they are approaching things differently. It could very well be much better, but... You know, it, I I kind of want to I kind of want to give it a couple of years first and see what they're really doing. They they sign Queen. I personally had reservations on Queen. Not that I don't think it's going to be an upgrade. I'm not sure, but he's also not the second coming, right? So I think that we need to temper some enthusiasm with some of these guys and see what they've done. We've still got issues at wide receiver, so you know we still got issues at corner. I know we signed Cam Sutton, but when is Cam Sutton going to play? So, yeah, and are we okay question. with signing Cam Sutton, right? So, you know, there's some questions I still have, personally. Uh, I do as well. I mean, I want to get into wide receiver later on, but the fact that there isn't a wide receiver at this point is is a blemish on Omar Khan. I, I don't think they planned to be going into training camp with this wide receiver core. I think they've been trying and haven't been able to do it, get a, yeah. get a deal done. Yeah. And that's something that you can you can mark him down on, and, and there's a few other things too. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you 100. It, it, it's it's a wait and see type thing to see if this is actually going to be better than than it was. We'll see. Uh, you brought up Cam Sutton. Let's let's get into him. Um, boy, I, I'm torn on this one. On on the field, I think they got very fortunate that Cam Sutton fell into their lap. He really fills a major need at again, another one at league minimum is kind of like Russell Wilson all over again, just falling into their laps. And I want to get to the lot on the field stuff, but off the field, and I'm not usually one to, to nitpick the stuff, but I read the affidavit this morning and Ron, it's brutal. Yeah. I mean, it's all alleged stuff, but there's like biting and closed fist punching and choking and it's wow it it's rough it's bad it, it it is and my um my assumption for what it's worth is that i think there was and i'm not saying this excuses anything but my assumption is they're looking at this as more of a psychological breakdown than a guy who's a physical abuser i i am not you know and i and i and it's all one and the same at the end of the day. Yeah. But I am saying that I think they're looking at this as a guy who had a breakdown and they feel like, you know, he's on the mend kind of thing. We, you know, you know, there, there will be people on all sides of this discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, But I do feel like that's how they're looking at it. And I feel like they're looking at Cam Sutton as a guy who needs help and a guy who went through something and did something really awful, but is on the other side of it, and you know will pay the pay the penalties and and the price that he needs to pay for having done what he did, but is also on the other side of it. If that all makes sense, so it does. It does. Yeah, I think that's how they're looking at it. People have compared him to oh, he's like Harris. You know, Her- They keep guys like Harrison, and they keep guys like Ben. And yeah, those you can guys make those come. Yeah, those guys were always on the team, though. They weren't going to cut Ben. They weren't going to cut Harrison. Yeah. But Cam Sutton was not on the team. So they made a conscious effort to say, this guy, we're still going to bring him on our team, as opposed to saying, hey, this guy was on our team, but you know we're going to deal with it, right? Yeah, so, that's a good point. I don't think it's the same thing. And so I hear what you're saying, and it's, you know, there are messages sent about, you know, because you're a good player, is it okay, right? You know, all these messages that that get yeah. sent are, are concerning. And look, you know, just from a sheer, like, you know, we, we've made fun of Cleveland. Can we do yeah. that anymore? You know, <laughs> I don't like, think we can. I, I right. in, in terms of this and uh, players on the team that with a checkered past, I mean, no, you can't. If you're going to bring in a guy like him, Sutton, after what he's done, and – no, you have no right. You, there's no moral ground to stand on anymore. I, right. To be honest, when I first heard that uh, they had talked to Cam Sutton, I think it was during the draft. Yeah. I honestly thought they were just like counseling him, like just giving him some advice. I never in my wildest dreams thought they were, you know, poking around to see, to sign him. And then 
about a month later, people started reporting that they had him in and they're talking contract. And I'm like, I, I honestly thought his career was over. I mean, after what was reported, then he, you know, kind of went AWOL for three yeah. weeks, I think it was, or maybe more yeah, than that. He was hiding for weeks. Yeah. I thought his – and now you find out it's been reduced to a misdemeanor, so his legal issues are pretty much behind him for the most part. Now we just wait on the league, which is something you brought up. Is there a suspension coming? How long is it going to be? Uh, the league's free to do whatever they want, but if it's a misdemeanor, uh, do they just give him a slap on the wrist? That's no, I, I think there's a similar – I'm trying to remember the other player. There is a similar case last year, and he, someone got a six-week, six-game suspension. I think he's going to be out for weeks, whatever number of weeks those are. Yeah, this, And that's something to keep in mind is, you know, there's going to be – four to six weeks where, you know, Cam Sutton's not going to be on the field, I think. So, you know, they're going to have to go with a Beanie Bishop or, you know, whatever else they do in that Darius yeah. Rush, whoever they fill that spot. There's a lot of guys there we can talk about. But, you know, yeah, so that's – they don't have them for a full year to start with. But, yeah, I mean, it's 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 an interesting question about, you know, why they – you know, why Cam Sutton – you know, you know why they felt like this was a move that they felt comfortable making, considering all the things that have happened. One big caveat to your point is, you know, the full story. You know, they've reduced the misdemeanor. What do we don't know? Yes. Yeah, so yes, 100%. You know, you're always, you know, innocent until proven guilty, and and Cam Sutton deserves that same consideration. But yeah, the affidavit is pretty, pretty damning. If it, if even half of it's true. Yeah. And I, I do want to preface that and almost, I should have prefaced it before. This is it's the affidavit is what he's being accused of. It may not may or may not be true. Um but he did go and hide for three weeks. Yes. And that's something not... happened because there were there in that affidavit there was talks of you know a welt on her forehead and bite marks yeah. on her and stuff. So that's that's in the police report. So something happened. I mean yeah, I don't know. As a father of you know daughters, it's and I don't want to get too, uh, you know too far in the weeds in this, but it, it after reading that, I was a little bit like my first thought was this is great for the Steelers, and then after it, I guess you gotta it, it's just like any other walk of life. You gotta there's bad guys and there's good guys, and yeah, we're allowed to be conflicted over it, you know. Yeah, and, and that's the way I put it. Yeah, I am too, very conflicted because. And this is a guy that had a pretty spotless record before this, right? I mean, we were all shocked when he heard about it. Yeah. Maybe it was a breakdown. Maybe it was a... Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, it. yeah, that that's kind of a, a thought that I had. Uh, you yeah, know, is that there are... You know, I had an interview with a player who, who said that there are players on teams that we don't know who have gone through many breakdowns, who have tried to kill themselves, who have done things, and they're still active in the league. So, you know, we we hear about this stuff, and, you know, you know we don't know half of what goes on, yeah. right? And so, you know, I, I do think that there's underlying, you know, underlying elements to all these stories that we just don't know that, that affect teams' decisions and how they treat players and, you know, we just we just won't know. Yep. Uh, switching to on the field, uh, whenever he does take the field for the Steelers, I mean, when you look at a secondary of Minka Fitzpatrick and Deshaun Elliott, JPJ, Dante Jackson, and now Cam Sutton in the slot, that's about as good as secondary as the Steelers have had in quite a long time. Yeah. If if everything works out. To yeah, play. I like Casey throwing Casey in the mix. Yeah, then, you have Casey for depth, and then you got, Rush, you got the two young guys, Rush, Rush and Trice. Yeah, it's I interesting. It's I think huh? it's solid. I think it really is. Um, it's been a long time since I've worried more about the pass rush than the secondary, and you know, <laughs> more about the pass rush than the secondary. Uh, I mean, Jackson's kind of a mystery to Steelers fans. We haven't yes. seen a lot of him. Uh, the Steelers certainly seem to like him. They try to trade it for him before, and. This is not the, you know, so this is the second go around of trying to get up, get him. And they finally did. Mm -hmm. So they clearly like him. You know, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see how he performs. He's sort of the big mystery to me. Elliot's kind of like that tried and true guy that everyone knows. Mm -hmm. Jackson's a little bit more of a mystery to me, but I think 
you know, everything on paper looks like he can be a solid number two. So it's definitely got to be an upgrade over Levi Wallace and Patrick Peterson, right? You would think anyway. I mean, Levi Wallace was pretty bad last year. Yeah, he was. And, uh, yeah, Peterson was sort of out of position. It's interesting that they decided to go with Sutton versus Peterson. That's a really, when you think about that, yeah. Peterson, he, he, it's like he's been camping at the doorstep of Steelers headquarters just saying, bring me in. Yeah, and they have we'll And I'm shocked. Sutton. I've been yeah. saying it since since the end of the season that he'd be back. I've been predicting it, and I'm uh, dead wrong. I don't – maybe the Steelers saw what we saw and, and – yeah, what I thought I saw that he had he had just lost, you know, he had just lost it. I mean, even when they played him at safety, he seemed to play better, but then there was missed tackles started creeping in, and you wonder, you know, at his age, switching positions. I mean, how long are you going to wait for him to to learn a position? So, I mean, I guess it's still possible they could bring him in. I mean, at this point, if he's just a depth guy, then I think they bring him in if there's injury. They bring him in if. Yeah. if- Sean, if you know Jackson gets you know, Dante Jackson gets hurt or you know something, I, I think if we're seeing Patrick Peterson, that means something went wrong. At this point. Yeah, you're probably right. You brought up Beanie Bishop before we leave the secondary. He's been he's had a pretty good camp. I'm really intrigued by him. I, yeah. I can't wait to actually see him in uniform and see how he does. Um, he's definitely the most intriguing undrafted free agent they brought in, and probably yeah. the best shot at making the team too. Yeah, it's it's weird because. You know, they they seem more more excited about him than some of the draft picks. And why wasn't he drafted? You know, that that always brings <laughs> that always like rises to my head, you know, like yep. if he's this if he's this solid answer to the slot that you thought he was gonna be before you even called him, then why wasn't everyone else thinking that too? And I, I'm not saying he isn't. It's just always a mystery to me. So yeah. I think, you know, he, you know, Scott, you know, Isaiah Scott's been good. Yeah. Scott, Scott's been good. Um, Darius Rush, people think that he could fill that slot position. Cam Sutton will obviously probably be the guy when he's healthy. Um, Thomas Graham is another guy. So there's a lot of guys that are throwing yeah. everything at that slot position except money. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so, except the yeah. most important one, money. <laughs> yeah. When you think about it, I mean, they really are. It's, it's almost like they treated the, they're treating it like the wide receiver spot. You know, it's like, we're going to yeah, throw like 500 guys and someone's going to stick. We'll, it's, whether, yeah. It's exactly the same. And and I wanted to talk about that next because they did the same thing. They're just throwing a bunch of low price players at the problem, hoping again. And it's every time they've needed something, it's fallen in their lap so far the last 18 months. So yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know where Omar Khan keeps his lucky charm, but I hope he holds on to that because again, yeah. a guy like Russell Wilson, just and I know he's not the second coming, and I know he's past his prime. But you get a veteran Super Bowl winning quarterback at league minimum. That doesn't happen every day, you know. And yeah, he's right. obviously not completely washed because he had a decent season with Denver. So we'll see. Um, this wide receiver two thing, the rumor still this will not go away. Um, Mike Lombardi on his podcast. This was uh, tweeted out, and I listened to his podcast, so I actually heard this, uh, that the Steelers had a deal almost done with the 49ers in the draft, and then something happened, and it fell through. Yeah. Uh, some have speculated that they thought they had Ayuk signed, so they were going to deal the Steelers. Um, um, Debo. Or Samuel. Debo, yeah. yeah. And that fe- the contract negotiations fell through, so they pulled out the Debo thing. Um, yeah, I – I still see a move coming. They have to make a move. They cannot go into the the year with this this wide receiver core. I, I think so. I don't think it's going to be the AU type of move. No. Uh, you know, but I think they will get bringing someone. I if they brought in like four guys who had really good years two three years ago, and yeah. you know, I I just don't see. You know, look, if you're all in, and they if they've made it abundantly clear they are, you mm-hmm. can't be all in with Van Jefferson as your you're no. a starting wide receiver. No. Or it's Calvin just, Austin or right. I mean Austin's had a great camp, but but in that run, and I was thinking about this, like could they start Calvin Austin? He, he's had a great camp. If he shines, you know, great OTA, should I say, if he keeps continues to shine, but they want to run the ball and Calvin Austin's not yeah. wide receiver, right? He's not gonna block for you like like you need him to. He'll want to, but he's not that yeah. guy. So he's not the answer. So to me, like Van Jefferson's yeah, he's a guy and until he's a, further notice. Yeah, he's the guy. I mean, 
So, but he is a guy, right? And so I don't know, you know, they, they, I think they need someone else and I think they will trade for someone. I think it'll be a Cortland Sutton kind of guy. I don't, or someone like that, but yeah, they're running out of time. Yeah, and, <laughs> they are. <laughs> and I, yeah, I just, you know, this is where I look at the team and I look at you know, the, the praise that's been heaped on the team, but I'm like, they don't have a wide receiver. Yeah. So and, this is one that Omar Khan has definitely missed on this off season. And I still, I said it about a month or two ago and I, I'm, it seems like Traylon Burks is the best option at this point. And he's young. He's been disappointing so far for sure. He's a bigger guy. Definitely could fill the blocking aspect if they needed it. Is he just um, another Van Jefferson or Callaway? Could be. Or, could be. I mean, I mean they need. I think they need a short guy, a guy who has proven that he can contribute. And I just think Burks is another guy you're you're throwing against the wall here, you know. And, he, and that's the worst. Probably right. I'm, and I hear what you're saying. I mean, Burks is another guy who should theoretically be a really good wide receiver, but he hasn't been on a no. team that needed one. So, you know, is is he any different than any of these other guys on the squad? And if not, then. That's not solving your problem. You need a guy. If you're winning now, you need a guy who's going to step in right now and you don't have to worry about him, you know? Yeah. And I don't think, you know, that Burks is that guy. I, you know, I mean, I, uh, ideally he's not. I, you're hundred percent right. He's not, but who is, I mean, well, they're guy. I mean, Samuel, I mean, I look at San Francisco and I still don't understand what they're doing. And here's why they have four wide receivers who mm-hmm. are starting wide receivers. They've got Kittle at tight end. They've got McCaffrey running back. There's one football. Yep. They've got to sign a lot of these guys to extensions. They have to, a couple and they're expensive. They've got to make a move with something somewhere or they're just going to lose guys in free agency. Maybe they're okay with that and they're all in as well. Yep. But, you know, look, they you can't get the ball to Jennings, Ayub, uh, Debo Samuel, and Pearsall. And Kittle, and Kittle and McCaffrey and, and McCaffrey. Yeah. <laughs> you just can't. So at some point, that's you know, you, I think you gotta get rid of one of those guys. And Samuel seems like the the guy, because I don't think they I think Abe is the future. Samuel is a guy they could probably part with. So I just yeah, that's the Samuel's the guy to me that seems like is is, is the candidate. So I look at Samuel, I look at his Cortland Sutton, I look at um uh, the guy for New York, Slayton. Darius Slayton, yeah. That's and those are guys that I see as, as guys that they would pursue and they could still land. But it is, you know, we're all looking at that June 1st deadline, you know, the June 1st time frame, and now it's June 8th. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, that feels like that excitement over the June 1st, you know, now it's spread over the cap concept is just like, I mean, okay, maybe not. Everyone's happy with their team right now. Nobody wants to trade it. Anyone, you think about the Steelers, who do you want to trade on this team? I mean, you want to see how these guys work out. You don't want to, you're right, San Francisco's loaded. Maybe they just try to do this for one year and make a run at a Super Bowl. And then, and then, because they have Debo, Debo Samuel under contract for a couple more seasons. If they can get Ayuk done, then they don't have to really do anything till next season or and the trade deadline anyway. Trick. I mean, that, that could be the, the, the trigger in all of this, right? So once, you know, maybe once Ayuk is signed, Samuel's gone. Right, possibly. Probably. But Sutton reported to camp, so that takes yep. the sort of the the fire out of that scenario. Um, Slayton isn't an issue uh, in terms of like showing up and playing. So yeah, I, I don't. And New York seems like they feel like they're they're contenders, right? So you don't get rid of Slayton. You know, it's not like they've got like this yeah. pile of receivers there. So. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know what's going on at receiver. And I feel like we're gonna look back on this and saying you're so close and you that you didn't fix that one thing and, and that that got in your way. Yeah. Um I brought this up with Dave and I want to get your take on it. Let's say we get to mid-August, they don't have a wide receiver, and Tyreek Hill is about to shoot himself out of Miami. Do you take on that contract and that potential locker room guy and he, on the field if he's... i think if they're contenders i mean i don't think hill's that huge of an issue but i don't think that you know off the field i don't you know 
I, I don't I mean, know. It's more about he's already out. griping for another contract is, is more where I was getting at. He's going to want a, a redo. He's already making, I think he's already making $30 million a season or close to it. So now you're. Yeah. I don't think it depends on, on what the, the cost is. Right. So you yeah. do you, is it, a, you know, do you trade? Yeah. You know, let's say, I mean, the scenario would have to be Miami would have to feel like they're out of it. Right. Cause they're not going to trade Hill if they're in it. So like if they're in, on a playoff run, Hill's not going anywhere. So if Miami's out of it, then, you know, do you, you know, then you got a bunch of people running after Hill, you know, there's going to be everyone and their mother's going to want to sign him. And, you know, do you for half a year trade a third round pick for a rental for a run at the Super Bowl? I mean, that's kind of what you're thinking. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Then sure. I mean, that's then you're saying, because, you know, it's not going to hurt your cap next year. So, you know, you, yeah, then maybe, but, you know, I don't know if, if, it, that that seems like an odd scenario to to fall into place like that. I, I just don't see that happening. I know he's griping about a contract, and I I don't know if they just sign Waddle or do they just get tired of listening to him and 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 deal him off. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I mean, that would again <laughs> something falling into Omar's lap once again. I mean, that would be yeah ridiculous. So yeah, I mean, I feel like I've been talking about this for months this wide receiver two thing and it's just i'm surprised that it'll let it get this far and i know they drafted roman wilson i guess you could use him as the outside receiver and maybe use austin as a slot and and hope he he develops quickly but you're not even hearing a lot with about wilson right now no I mean, we haven't heard anything the only thing i've heard about wilson and it's not necessarily a knock on wilson is that benny bishop has looked really good locking him down that's not good. So that's the only <laughs> thing I've heard. So, but again, that I don't know how much that really means or what, you know, what context to put that in. But yeah, I mean, it's, I am surprised too that, that they haven't had any kind of resolution on this. And it's, you know, they've got a lot of guys who have had one good year, two, three years ago. And, and it feels like they're just hoping one of these guys just does it like, Evidently, uh, Callaway's had some good, you know, some good uh, plays at camp. He's shined a little bit. Uh, Austin's been the most impressive receiver at camp outside of Pickens. So, yeah. do you just say, do you just like, just go great guns and say, you know what, screw it, we're gonna start Austin? I mean, at what point do you just say, you know what, he's our biggest playmaker? You no, know, you know, not size wise, but you know, he's our biggest yeah. playmaker. Um, uh, you know, do we do we roll with that, right? Do we just say, hey, you know what? We've got a guy who has done nothing but shine. If he shines in camp, he shines in preseason. Do you not keep him on the field? I mean, at what stage do you say, like, you know, Van Jefferson's experience and his size does not equate to a reason to keep your second best player off the field? Yeah, I mean, potentially. I think the only, I think honestly, the only way he gets on the field is in the slot. I think Van Jefferson's locked in unless they make a trade. Yeah, that's the frustrating part for me. This is where the Steelers get. Yeah, I I hear you. And yeah, this is what frustrates me because, you know, there are often times when the best player isn't on the field. And, you know, because you're, you're tied into a scheme so, so deeply that you're not, playing your best guys that that you know that would that would be upsetting if a van jefferson is getting reps when calvin if if calvin austin is shining and continues to shine yeah i mean training camp is going to be huge for him uh, to keep this 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 ball rolling uh speaking of training camp they announced the dates it is july 25th august 14th a lot of 10 30 a.m starts which is different for them yeah Um, uh, friday night lights is august 2nd uh, I guess they're going to have the full their full complement. Uh, Cam Hayward's back in the fold. He's not going to do any more. He made his point. He's back in camp. Yeah, um, that's good. For, I, I really believe he needs to be there for the team, for himself. You made yeah. your point. We know you're unhappy. The team knows you're unhappy. What? I'm yeah. glad to see him back at OTAs. I'm glad to see him back at camp. Yeah, they, I don't think they can win without him. Their defensive line is not. Deep yeah, no, you're right. Enough to, to win without him. So, yeah. I, I have issues on how much to pay him in a new contract, but you're absolutely right. Without him in 2024, they're, they're sunk. 
Yeah. You, I mean, I look at him and I see, you know, look, two years ago and three years ago, there was a 10 plus sack guy who had, you know, 14 or plus more tackles for losses. He was in the leaders and all that stuff. And in a defense that doesn't accommodate defensive linemen getting sacks very well. So mm-hmm. last year he was hurt. I know he's older. I do think that he's a guy who can contribute at a high level. Is he top five? Probably not. Top 10? Maybe. Uh, so do you, and what he does in the locker room, you know, his leadership and all, I think it would really, really suck to see him elsewhere. And I think he's got a couple good years still to, to, to contribute. I'm not saying he should get 25, 30 million a year, obviously, but 15 to 20, I, I give him 20 next year and 15 the year after and then, you know, or something like that, whatever. I think what he does for this team is still valuable. And, you know, I, I don't think this team has an answer without him. So, yeah. I mean, I'd be fine with 20 and 15 the next two seasons. It's just guaranteed money. And I guess that's going to be the big sticking point for this is how much guaranteed they give him going forward. Um, yeah, he's still not no worse than top between ten and fifteen as a defensive okay. lineman if he's healthy. And defensive linemen like, don't, you know, it's the speed guys who deteriorate faster than the than the big guys. Yep. Yeah. Oddly. That's true. Yeah. That's true. And that's, yeah. he is thirty five. That's that's a little concerning. Um, yeah. It's a tough position. I mean, he. The one thing you can say about Cam Hayward is he's he's grinded it out. And he's rarely been hurt. And yeah. He's taken punishment. So uh, that stuff adds up. But yeah, I mean, for the next two seasons, they need him. I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, you've got Keanu Benton behind him, and that's about it. I mean, Larry Ogunjobi is okay, but not great. There's some there's some guys behind those guys, but no one Larry, at that level. They like it. yeah, it's a, it's a solid backup, but. You know, saw the backup, yeah, but not. Yeah, you've got three starters, and you got a lot of backups. Yeah, we all sort of faded away, mm-hmm. uh, and everyone else is someone you hope will, you know, they're the louder milks and yeah. the Logan Lees and and those guys who are good rotational guys who can contribute, but they're not going to be guys that are going to start. So you've got Ogan Joby, you got Benton, and you got Cam, and then you got a lot of guys. So. Yeah, you're not you're not in a position right now to yeah. to not have Kim Hayward on the field. It's one of the positions they really needed to draft earlier and couldn't because of all the other needs they had. Yep. You know, so that kind of fell by the wayside. Um, and we talked about it a lot going into the draft. It was just too many holes and not enough draft picks to fill all those. Right. You know, they didn't they didn't do anything in the slot corner either in the draft. They just they went line line and then wide receiver. So. Yeah, it's they need Cam Hayward. They need they need a high level Cam Hayward if they're going to win. This defense overall should be very very good if people stay healthy. Yeah, I mean, you brought the best inside linebacker and on, on free agency aboard. Right, you, know, you got the corner you wanted. I have my problems with Dante Jackson. I don't think he's that great, but this is the one that Mike Tomlin has been salivating over for years. You you, you yeah. said it. They tried to trade for him before. They traded arguably their best wide receiver to get him. So. He better be good. Yeah, I mean, this is this is, you know, this is where you start. You know, this is where you see how good the front office really is. Mm-hmm. What you see on the field with the Dante Jackson and and and, what, and Patrick Queen and all these guys and how they perform. This yeah. will be the true test. It's it's not what we've seen on paper. This will be when they play and you see how these guys perform. And then we'll know you know, how we've done. Uh, I've had reservations with Queen. I think he's a really good player. I don't think he's, I don't think his play on the field has matched the athleticism that he's had, right? And so it's almost this reverse picture of what they're doing, you know, what they've done. Like, you know, we talk about Colbert, you know, and, and those, the, that scouting department, how they looked at the play on the field and that superseded the the RAS scores, right? Yeah. But now you got a guy whose RAS scores are like off the charts, whose play on the field is really good. It's not, I don't feel it's elite. So now, you know, now we'll see who's right, you know? Yeah. yeah. They got, uh, I, I wrote this for my, uh, for my site this week. Mike Tomlin has no more excuses. Uh, this is the defense 
there is there are no holes in this defense. He's got the players he wanted. This defense needs to perform at a high level. So the offense, because the offense is going to need time. And you're gonna you're gonna start probably yeah. two rookies and a second year player who's essentially a rookie at Broderick Jones. You know, right. if he gets he gets the left tackle, he didn't even play left tackle last season. That's gonna take time. You got a brand new quarterback, a brand new offensive coordinator. So you you you're gonna need that defense to carry you the first 100 percent And I worry weeks. about how they're treating the line too. I, I really do because I feel like Well, yeah, that's yeah, I, I I I worry that they're just they're they're playing a little bit too much with the offensive line. It's like this it's like a, a new a new game they've got as opposed to just saying, you know what, this is what's gonna be. You know, get Jones out there and just play him on left tackle, get Fatano out there and play him at right tackle, whoever you know, whatever that lineup is, just lock it in and go run with it. I I, I worry that they're going to slow roll it. I get that that happens. I get that you want experience. But the first two games of the year against are against teams whose pass rushes and whose whose defense alignment are not really stellar. Yep. So that's a great way to get Fatana started. Then you start getting into some real serious talent. You get San Diego after that, I think, and, and so they've got good pass rushers. You yeah. know, and you got uh, some other guy, some other team. Then I think if they have Indianapolis, and you have another team who has good pass rushers. I'm trying to remember the the sequence of teams, but those first yeah, two I games can't. are games where you can get Fatano in there yeah. again not elite pass rushers and get him set. And as opposed to just starting more because, you know, Moore's got experience, you, you know, at some point, the better player has got to play. I mean, you trade it up to get Broderick Jones. If yeah. he can't beat Dan Moore out at the left tackle spot, then, then you've whiffed on that pick. Because yeah. Dan Moore is a bottom third left tackle in this league. If not, well, I think the question more for them is, can Feltano start at right tackle, right? Is yeah, he ready? I, but, I mean, you don't – I mean, you don't take the guy where you did if he's not. Yeah. I mean, all we heard was, this, uh, to, to your point again, uh, how did this guy fall to the Steelers? How is it possible? What yeah. a steal. Well, let's find out. Yeah. Let's find I mean, out. And that's what drives me crazy. Like, all these guys fall to you and you're like, oh, this is the best guy that's ever played the game. Because he fe- and he fell to you at like twenties, and a guy who's <laughs> Beanie Bishop, who we're so excited about, and I am excited about him. I'm not knocking the player at all, but like he was an undrafted guy. So if we are counting on this guy to solve yeah. one of the bigger positions and holes on your team, that seems faulty to me. Now it doesn't mean he won't work out, but that's not, you know, a strategy. It's not a good process. Yeah, that's not. That's... that's not how you want to fill a position. You're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, it, right. I don't understand it. And I know they brought Cam Sutton in now. So, but yeah. Cam Sutton's not going to play for six weeks. I just feel like there's a lot of, a lot of hope <laughs> that these guys, that yeah. this mass of guys in certain spots are going to work. And there's a lot of, I don't I, I sometimes I'm not so sure how they're approaching some things. And the, the Steelers always do things oddly. And it, to me, it's always, there's always something. Mike Tomlin, the way he goes about, I mean, I guess we'll never know what Chooks really said or how he ended up being benched those last, what was it, eight weeks he got benched for? Six weeks? But in a vacuum, he's clearly, they were would have been clearly better with Broderick Jones at left tackle and Chooks at right tackle. And, I yep. mean... Mike Tomlin's looked the other way at a lot of stuff. I mean, we heard those stories of James Harrison not showing up to meetings, sleeping in meetings at that last season, and they didn't cut him till almost the very end. Um, they he puts up with a lot of stuff. We we heard stuff about that wide receiver room last year and all the shit he put up with with Deontay Johnson and George Pickens in that that wide receiver room. So, what the hell happened? I know it's yeah. he dared say quit, but I, I don't buy that so much. Yeah, said, I let's kneel on the ball. I, I think yes, it was a combination of a lot of things. I think he was a guy that they weren't going to keep anyway monetarily. I don't, I don't think he was playing to the contract. I think they had a less of opinion on his playing than than maybe we did. Um, and I, I think he was a foregone conclusion anyway. I think this get made. It, I think it just made it easier. And that might have just been it. But I, I feel like they lost a year with Broderick Jones by leaving him at right tackle. I, I don't and, worry about it 
if and look, I don't even care if he plays right tackle his whole career, right? I just but you drafted another tackle. Yeah. So you drafted two tackles in back to back years. Like and <laughs> both were steals. Both were like, how do we get this guy guys? And you got a guy conversely who is starting at left tackle right now, who, you know, who's probably playing above what people ever expected him to play. So, you know, all the all the credit in the world to Dan Moore for for doing that and being a stand-up guy and helping the young guys. Yep. Yep. But having said that, you know, he should be somewhat easily replaceable, you know, somewhat easily you sort of step back for your first round pick who no one ever thought could be there and who they salivated over, et cetera. So yep. if you don't have those two tackles starting, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, that confuses me. I mean, you know, I get you want to slow roll some guys because they need some time, but your first round offensive draft pick offensive tackles shouldn't need to sort of take a second fiddle to Dan Moore. 100%. I mean, most first round picks start now anyway. I mean, especially ones that you trade up into the yeah. teens to get that those guys play. That's and not I like, I think if you have like this really, you know, if, if they're studying under like a solid vet, who's good at, yeah. you know, is just holding down the position for another year, you know, kind of thing. I'm not sure that's what Dan Moore is though. Dan Moore is a guy that, that you always wanted to replace yep. and to I mean, drop. Clearly. Guy, yeah, I don't know. You drafted tackles two years in a row. You're trying to replace them. Do it. Yeah, let's, and let's, that's the that's the thing. Like, just do it. And and playing around. I mean, and all the more reason. Like, if you want this guy to to be the future, give him every chance to be that guy. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I don't this, know. We'll see. It drives uh, Dave crazy and, and me too. For the position flexibility thing, they they always you know drub us with like yeah. that we want our offensive linemen to be and it's gonna backfire you need it, to it pick has. a position you're right if it's gonna be right tackle for roger jones all right leave him there put fuatano at right uh left tackle and let's go uh, pick a position leave them there don't brag about how many positions they can play because yep. if you can play if you're if you play too many then you don't play any well that's yeah if you're jack of all trades master of none you're yes. not you know, and you could do that with a fourth, fifth round pick, but you know, you don't do that with your first round picks. I mean, they did it with Sean Davis. They do mm-hmm. it with Gal, I think. I Gal, they did. Yep. I think that that sidetracked his career a little bit. You know, that that stuff worries me. I, I I think that you know, I'd rather you just let a guy learn a spot. And I'm not a coach; they know better. But I do think they're not infallible. And I think that when you take these guys who are high quality really high draft picks. These are not low picks that you're just trying to figure out how we use these guys, you know, play them where they're supposed to be played. Don't like, don't waste time. Don't like mess around with them. You know, I think they totally messed around with Sean Davis. A hundred percent. I think he would have been a Hall of Fame player. I don't know, but I think he never, I think they messed with him. I think they did that with Leal. I think Leal probably hasn't helped himself either, but I think uh, from, from what I'm hearing, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, sometimes it's okay to simplify things a bit. Yeah. I mean, how do you succeed when you're a de- tackle one year, you're an end midway through the season, then we're not sure how we're going to use you the next season. It, yeah. They are playing with not, outside linebacker. Yep. And they, that worked for like a game. So they got enamored with that and they decided they were going to keep them. And then they changed their mind because it stopped working after a few games. I don't know. Now, he's clearly not an outside linebacker. He's too big to be an outside linebacker. Yeah. He's an end. Yeah. And maybe a bad fit for a 3 4 defense. Maybe he's an end on a, a 4 3, and maybe that's the problem. But yeah, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, Ron, this was a great talk. I appreciate you coming on. Um, you got anything to plug? I heard you're trying to get Phil Kreider. That'd be awesome. I'd like to hear that one. Yeah, I would too. Uh, I should hear from him next week. Um, Mark, uh, you know, Mark Barron. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm trying to remember uh, who else I got coming up, but uh, the guy uh, Kentley Platt, the the Ras guy, I think is is was a really interesting conversation. Uh, but Morgan Burnett spoke to him, so that nice. so Morgan Burnett and Kentley Platt will be a couple of interviews you'll see next week that that have some you know, kind of unique perspectives, and Morgan Burnett will just sort of dispel some of the the thoughts that people had on him and his you know sort of his play in Pittsburgh. Awesome, looking forward to it. All right. Um... 
I thanks thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. you can find Ron at Steelers Takeaways on Twitter. You can find me at Steelers Thanks 16. And as always, thanks for listening to the Steelers Thanks Right Podcast. Thank you.